that should do it. <laughs> Thanks for the tech support. Um, it, it looks like we're putting this game on pause, which is gut-wrenching because they are in the middle of a super tense, stacked-out board state with multiple people seconds away from the dub. So um, everyone's on the edge of their seat. I'm on the edge of my seat, but I'm also super excited to be here talking with you, Sheldon. Um, you, yeah, I mean, there's your honorifics speak for themselves. You are Sheldon. You're the... You know, father of this format and uh, level five judge and uh, all around super awesome dude. So welcome and uh, yeah, glad to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm, just, I'm sorry I wasn't tuned into the game. It sounds uh, it sounds pretty exciting. If I mean, like it's been like an hour and a half of like ah, like full on just edge of your seat, just wild games, uh, rebel. It, it's it's in a crazy place right now, so I'm really okay. excited to get back to it. But I'm also, like I said, excited to talk to you. I've got sure. this whole list of questions here that you were sent. Um, uh, we kind of you know fluffed you a little bit as far as like getting you used to what we're going to be talking about, sure. and and you even kind of gave most of them the thumbs up. So I'm yeah. I'm pumped about that too. So I'm good to just uh, jump right into it. Right um, into it. As long as you are. Um, yeah. So, what are your initial impressions on this particular take on uh competitive magic i well, know we I, kind of uh briefed you on the structure and all that stuff. Right. so like i guess in that vein the i mean the, the the thing is that a good a good tournament and judges and players want the exact same thing out of a tournament by the way they want a clean well-run tournament Right, the player now the players also have the the meta motivation they want to win, but for the most part, you know they know that not everybody's going to win, but they still want the clean, uh, fair, well-run tournament. Um, I think this kind of structure makes things easier for everybody involved. Right, it's not, you know, a a, a Magic Pro Tour can be a really grindy experience. And when you when you break up the, the 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 thing into a league structure, you give the players time, right? It's it doesn't become so much of an endurance contest as it as it might when you're playing back to back to back really really long days. Um, so I think I think in the in the end that's really good for the players. <clears throat> and I think the a, a league structure also means that. Um, you can also have a bad day and still get there, right? Like if, like if you're, it, again, at a pro tour, if you're off your game one day, forget about it. Yeah. Right? Um, and I think given, giving players um, time, to, time to regroup maybe after a particularly tough loss, you know, uh, you know, we talk about this this exciting game that's gonna, that's going to wait the next half hour to finish. Um, three people are not going to win that, yep. uh, so they're gonna, you know, they're, they're gonna have to. They're gonna be in a place where they're like, "Well, too bad for me." But the, I, I think the, I think the real thing is that anytime you give players the kind of tournament structure that gives them. The, the sort of best feeling about how their participation was, you've done a good job. So that seems like that seems like what we're doing here. That you know, you've given the players, and I noticed, you know, I was looking at the records. The players all seem pretty ne evenly matched, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm on Team Rebel, so <laughs> um, you and you and a lot of people, like <laughs> myself as well. <laughs> Um, but the you know the the fact that there was nobody running away with anything told me a lot about how good you were at um, getting the players into these brackets. Um, yeah. And the you know the, some some real thought process went into it. So I think that was that's good. Good tournament magic is good for the players who are playing in it, um, and it's good for the people who are watching it too. I think, like, I, I like your point about, like, it being mostly even. And when you look at these scores and you look and you see that there are people with this, like, you know, even record of, like, five wins, five losses, like, even that starts to look like running away with it when you start to look at a larger CEDH tournament because that's right. an incredible record for a, a four-person right. pod. 
So it's it's been really cool to see the structure and I love the idea of being able to rest. So I've been um, casting Rebels games for the past 12 weeks and mm -hmm. it's been amazing to kind of work with her kind of on the back end as well and be able to talk with her about strategies and about where her head is at and to see that regrouping process. You know, it's like that rest between rounds. Um, yeah. They talk about, like you said, competitive... Um, you know, GPs or whatever they are, like a full day of playing is way different, you know, and being able to regroup between games counts for absolutely everything. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, I know that there are some high level players that choose particular decks for Pro Tours based on giving themselves maximum amount of rest time in between, right? That, that uh, you know, you could play the, the, the grindy control deck that goes to time every time. But what you do there is you don't give yourself any time in between rounds. You know, you gotta go to the bathroom, you gotta get a drink, you have to eventually eat or whatever. And, uh, you know, I know there are plenty of players that like, all right, I'm, I'm gonna play a deck that's win or lose is gonna get there in, you know, 30 of the 55 minutes or whatever, uh, because yeah. it's better. it's better for me for the, the sort of holistic sense so um we spoke about you being a level five judge how does that experience uh influence your thoughts on this sort of structure i mean you talked about the impact of the player mm -hmm. are there any other ways that it would um you know influence the way you think about this especially in that this is with the point structure being more sports oriented uh, uh -huh. does that kind of you know influence your thought on how this has been produced and well i mean I, Again, I'm going, to, I'm going to go back to my point that the the tournament that is the the best for the players is the, is the most equitable and the one that they think it is the most fair uh, is the one. You know, if if players thought that um, three points for a win and one point for a draw was the best, but you're only giving them two for a win and one for a draw, there's going to be um, so there's going to be tension between the the player and the organizer. So I yep. think the, so when the when the organizer provides the the players with the kind of structure that that resonates with them, that they you know that they consider ultimately fairest. There's probably no perfect tournament structure. So the the one that's that that they consider fairest, then again you you have what's internally a good tournament and. Uh, and then, of course, the the spectators don't you know care much much less about the structure. They just care about the game. Like they yeah. they care that here I am blabbing about tournament magic while they're waiting for a couple of spells to resolve. <laughs> so taking all that into consideration, um, the the kind of amity the the. The attitude of the players, it seems like this has been a roaring success because of the way that it's been produced, because of the rule sets. Um, would a format like this make you, at, like from outside, from outside the judge perspective on a personal level, would this make you more or less interested in continuing to watch competitive magic? Or uh, watching competitive magic? Yeah, I, I mean, for again, for me as a spectator, I think the game matters, but the game has to have the answer is yes because the game that i'm watching has to have have gravitas right if mm. if the game that i'm watching is um you know at table 164 as opposed to table 2 uh, that's going to impact my viewing experience so so when every game matters when every every game and every position of every game matters if it's if it's more of a skins game, then as a spectator, I'm probably going to be a little more invested. Um, yeah. You know, p personally, my my interest my interest in competitive magic is a lot more academic than it is practical at this point. Um, yeah. You know, I I retired as a judge ten years ago. <laughs> um, Worlds in 2011 was my last tournament. Um, yep. And then, of course, I broadcast from the Pro Tour for two more years before um, uh, stopping that to go back to grad school. But um, it's been a long time since I've been heavily invested in tournament magic. Um, yep. 
So you would definitely, you know, I'm a, I, I would then be a casual fan, which would mean you'd have to get me with, again, a structure that makes every game important, uh, and of course, players that I want to watch. And that's that's a huge part of why I'm so like hugely invested in this is because mm -hmm. I know a number of the people who are mm -hmm. on this roster, and because it has this is something I spoke about in the pregame show. This deck has uh, this. Sorry, this this tournament is a global event. You've taken players from all over the world, from all different metas, and kind of jammed them in. So it's kind of you know, got everybody buzzing from all aspects, all reaches of the CEDH community, mm -hmm. which I think is really amazing. So um, that's a good segue um, as far as like reach of the CEDH community. Um, something that I've seen recently is that, you know, in, you know, being um, enfranchised in the magic scene and the socials and all that, I've seen different pro players start to kind of pick up EDH decks and kind of look at it and kind of wrap their mind around that structure. Um, so how would you say the principles that are applicable to 60 card competitive magic, um, how would they be relevant to a CEDH game? Uh, well, I mean, you, you still have to give yourself the best chance to win the tournament, not just any individual game. I mean, that, that would be my, that would be my first thought because you, you don't play, especially in, com in a competitive environment. You don't play in a vacuum. You play against other. You play against other decks, and um, here you're playing uh, not against one deck at a time, but against three decks at a time. So you really have to be ready. Um, I, I think the. I think there's an extra layer that would that goes on to a multiplayer tournament that uh, that the sixty card tournaments don't have, uh, and that of course is just the fact that. You, it, you're always three on one, right? Yep. You're, you, you always have three opponents, even if there are times when, when your interests might be aligned with two other people. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if nobody wants player four to win right now, players one, two, and three are all on the same team momentarily. But, uh, but for the most part, you're, you're still out there alone um, it, it's, you know, nobody's, nobody's countering that spell so that you don't lose. They're countering it so that they don't lose. Yeah. So there's, a, there's a, an extra layer, uh, added on to a multiplayer, uh, tournament than, uh, than there would be in a 60 player tournament. Absolutely. And, and one of the layers that is so um, at the forefront of EDH is the politics. And it's something we see in different levels, depending on the, the meta. So like in a CEDH meta, the politics are more um, threat assessment based, whereas on a casual le level, they could be all over the map. So right. how would you feel about table politics being an aspect of competitive gameplay? I, I think that I think that there are there there actually I'm gonna I think I'm gonna go the other direction and say at the competitive level there are no actual politics that okay that, that it it's all about giving yourself the best chance to win you're not gonna you're not gonna talk anybody into doing anything at a competitive table uh, you might bully them into doing it based on your seat position right the politics the politics might be um, if uh, you know, if you cast something and I'm in the seat to your left, I might be able to play into making player three or four do it, something about it instead of yep. doing it myself. But other than that, I, there, there aren't politics in the sense in a competitive event that, that there are at casual tables where it's like, hey, can, you know, can somebody not wrath for at least one turn or, yep. or, or just talking about, you know, if you don't attack me next turn, I'll get rid of that en enchantment um, kind of politics. Those, those okay. things don't; those things aren't applicable to um, a competitive game. Okay, so I've I've been definitely thinking about it in the light of like threat assessment and kind of analyzing. So I guess it's you can look at them from two different lenses. That uh, analytically saying like if you guys don't do X, he's gonna win that doesn't that's not politics so much as like a no. game state you know yeah. so that makes a lot of sense so 
What would what do you think people find so attractive about CEDH specifically to kind of diverge a little bit, you know? Um, and it's a totally an interesting question for you to look at because it's kind of antithetical to the, you know, the the basically the foundations of what mm -hmm. you've made. Why would why do you think people find it so attractive? Well, I mean, the the because because they I don't want to get tautological, but because they do because it's a, <laughs> it's a thing because it's a thing that resonates with them, right? Yeah. That that there is a there is a certain niche, um, you know. There's a small a small part of the the whole commander player base that finds this thing attractive. They like whether they're a player themselves or just a spectator or the player spectator, you know, for the player that likes to do both. Um, there is a kind of adrenaline high that you get from these super intense, super fast board states. Right, you, you, th in a in a competitive game, things happen right away. Right, if you're if you're not doing stuff until turn three, then you're not in the game. Yeah. And um, so, for a for a subsection for a subsection of the commander um, the community, that just resonates that that the sort of um, the sort of high charge. Um, now or never kind of game with with immediacy. Uh, you know, we the, the RC likes to promote commander games that that kind of slowly unwind. That are like a um, uh, like that are like more, they're more like a baseball game than okay. than, a, than a competitive game is a boxing match. Right, you're just in there right away, slugging <laughs> it out. Uh, yep. There's no time. There's no time to step out between pitches. And uh, in um, you know in the in the sort of target demographic of the format, um, we like to take things to take their time. So I think for this um, for this you know small percentage audience that this is this like I love this and yeah. and quite honestly, we want you to love it. You know, right? If, yeah. If that's what you love, then then love it. Uh, it's not necessarily what what we're doing, but we're not going to stop you from doing what you want. Yep. This is the we being the the RC the kind RC. of like the awesome. Yeah, and I've I've found so much that um that that really looking at it through that lens really does begin to kind of go back towards the foundations of it is like it's a format for people to express themselves, and if people want to express themselves by um. I wouldn't. I don't like to say breaking the game state, but by making powerful plays or using very, you know, wild combos or doing things as efficiently as possible, that that's a form of expression and it falls completely in line with the. I think you can. I think you can say breaking because because <laughs> because the, the format's broken. I mean, we we recognize that the format is broken. It says so in the philosophy document. It's the last line of the philosophy document says we realize that this format can be broken, and we think yep. games are better. We think games are better when you don't. Yep. Uh, but again, when you get four people together who want to sit down and break it together, then great. You know, good, yep. good, good for them. Um, I don't think that hurts anybody else. Um, yep. It's when it's when the those four those four players, or you know, or that you know that small group of players says. Well, you need to make the whole thing about what we're doing that yeah. we we sometimes come to loggerheads. Absolutely. Um, I'm super glad to hear that. That's awesome. Um, so looking at it from like a top-down perspective and from a long period of time, how would you say um, the growth of, and this is something I'm sure you've answered a zillion times, but how would you say the growth of CEDH has impacted the EDH as a whole, whether it's the community or the, you know, choices within it, rules, what, like, any any way you can, how would you say that CEDH has uh, impacted it? Well, I think that the the big thing is that we realize we, I, it's, it's caused us to think about sub-communities, right? The, the, and, and kind of give some deep thought into not, not just a particular subcommunity, but the idea of 
that you know the fact that that there is no global commander metagame. Uh, yeah. There's there's no um, there's no even a regional or uh, necessarily local because you have people that are playing across very different play styles from the you know from the dirtiest of dirtle fest up to the the you know the fastest of the of the combo decks. So you think about that, and you have to, and we think of, it makes us think about how we're going to approach serving as many people as we possibly can. The, yeah. the, the problem, of course, becomes that if you, if you take care of one group, you might be um, ignoring another. Uh, and I mean, I, it, it's also taught us a, a great deal about messaging. And how some people, no matter what you say, some people are prone to uncharitable readings of what you said. And, you know, there are people in the CDH community who get up in arms when, when we say, we're privileging this style of play. You know, this is the, yeah. the target tar demographic, the sort of casuals, the fives and the sixes. This is, this is you know, the, the primary part of who we're looking at when we shape the commander format. And, you know, I've heard people take that as you hate us and, <laughs> uh, and you're telling us we're, we're playing it wrong. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's absolutely not the case. And I can't, of course. There, there, there's almost no way for me to reshape the message there um, for them to take it any other way, right? If they're prone to taking it away, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I would, uh, my only thing is please, you know, really kind of look at what we said and, uh, Nobody hates you. Nobody says you're doing it wrong, right? Enjoy, enjoy it the way that you want to enjoy it. Don't try to, you know, don't try to force it on anybody that doesn't want it. But it's just cool. enjoy it. You're like, like go for it. Um, yeah. We're we 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 can we can love you and not make all our decisions based on you at the same time. Absolutely, and that's um. That's a, a really beautiful open statement, and just just like you know, and it, and also I could see it. It's kind of like a like a open like kind of like hey, it's cool, and also like a please like please guys, it's cool. <laughs> so um, so from that and from part of what you said about like you know as long as everybody's on the same page, uh, this is something that I've kind of tried to put at the forefront of the content that I make. I've seen multiple people picking it up uh, at your behest at many people's kind of urging um, the pregame discussions, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and of course there's different ways to have a pregame discussion. Like even I've, I've learned that like the pregame discussion when I'm sitting at a kitchen table is different from the pregame discussion when I'm going live uh, and streaming right. um, because there's different things involved. The pregame discussion for um, a casual game will be different from the pregame discussion for a competitive game. Like I was talking about it with somebody recently and brought up that like with a competitive game, like you have to start to go deep into if you're playing a competitive game in a casual setting, you know, what are your allowances for takesies backsies? Like that's a, a legitimate question that like yeah. most people, you know, a lot of the times wouldn't come up. So um, stemming from that, uh, do you think that CEDH, you know, as a whole, has improved or uh, influenced pregame discussion? Uh, well, the the fact that CEDH exists, I think, has engendered more pregame discussions because there's, you know, there's a there's a thing that maybe some people weren't aware of that may come into the to the conversation. Like, well, this is the, you know, so if the, and rule zero is really important in untrusted groups and, and people you don't know, right? If you've been playing together, it, your rule zero discussion already has a lot of um, uh, unwritten things read into it. You know, yeah. when, the, um, when the RC plays on our stream on Thursdays, we, we have a rule zero discussion on like, what kind of game would we like tonight? But that's a, what kind of game would we like in the set of parameters that we've already established for ourselves, yeah. right? We know that this is, uh, we know that um, if we want, if one of us wants to play mass land destruction, we say, hey, I want to play that deck that has mass land destruction in it. 
you don't, you know, it's it's not it's not a surprise factor thing. And yeah. um, I mean, usually we're all like, all right, who wants to play what? And like, oh, I want to play this, and then everybody everybody picks a deck appropriate to the you know the person who's got the mood. When you're in an untrusted game, your conversation is what has to be way longer, right? You have to you have to start out from the okay, what kind of experience do we want together here? And um, I can I can see rule zero discussions getting a little involved when you don't know the other players. Um, the 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 thing that I think that that people probably want to discuss first in that isn't power, but time. I think I think the T axis of of a game is way more telling than the than the P axis, if you will. The when a deck does a thing is more significant to shaping the kind of experience you're going to have than what the deck does. Um, doing it, doing some things on turn thirteen, like for me, whatever it is you do on turn thirteen is fine. I like right. I I don't care. Um, if you're doing the same thing on turn three, then we, you know, maybe we've come to the kind of game that, that we didn't agree on. Yeah. Um, so, so taking that critical turn, taking when that critical turn is and, and sort of putting it on the, on the, the game line map is important to, to having your, your pregame discussion. Uh, I think, I think high power discussions are easier than low power discussions because again you've you've already narrowed part of the focus into where you are like if if the if initial part of your pre of your pregame discussion is an, an already read no holds barred then you don't have many other things to discuss yeah right uh it's it's when okay um you know I, i'm playing at this level, or you know, I'm playing a, a, a an upgraded precon uh, as opposed to my you know somewhat high powered deck with my, all my fast mana and duels in it. I mean, then you have then that's when you have to to really have a discussion. What I've found specifically in a you know no holds barred scenario or a C, like you know true you know CEDH scenario is that the the aside from like your takes these backs these kind of conversations and that sort of thing the conversation becomes about shaping how the game is going to play out in a totally different way in deck choice so people start to um think about what decks are going to compose the table mm -hmm. and how it's going to play out from there so like you could go for a totally even game of like one stacks deck one turbo deck a mid-range deck and then like a fringe deck or something like that or you could say okay we're all going to go for broke right now and we're all going to play a turbo deck mm -hmm. um so that's something that i found really kind of is a is a relevant conversation because there are ways to shape the way a game plays it's it's, it's the same question though what kind of game do you want to have Right. Do you want to have a game where we're all just trying to race each other and ignore the ignore each other, or do you want to have a game where we are all grinding this one out and we're going to have mm -hmm. a, a a stack that's eight cards deep and we're all going to freak right. out? You know, um, mm -hmm. it looks like we are just about wrapped. Uh, any parting thoughts on the the MLC or anything here? Uh, you know, I I want I want people to have fun playing Commander, and if yep. you're if you're having if you're having fun even if it's a way in which we didn't um, design or uh, anticipate, then go for it. I mean, we, you know, I, I obviously wouldn't have come here if I actually hated CDH. <laughs> well, we truly appreciate the mindset and uh, truly appreciate your blessings. I think I can say <laughs> for everybody when, when, you know, hearing that, like, you know, the RC, Sheldon, everybody just wants people to play Magic the way that they want to play Magic. And to do it with a... Uh, a focused mindset is beautiful. So thank you so much for coming out, being a part of this, um, and sharing some of your wisdom with us. My pleasure. Anytime. Awesome. I think we're... And go Rebel.
Yeah, go Rebel for sure. We're going right back into the game from here. Um, I think they're probably about ready to go. Um, so yeah, thanks again, and uh, I look forward to talking with you soon, working with you. All right, hey. be good. Yeah.